Good evening, folks. Welcome. This is FM Discussion, episode 289, 11 away from the Big 300. And tonight we feature both father and daughter. First time for FMA Discussion to have a father and daughter guest on here. And I think that's really neat. I think there's nothing more inspiring in seeing a father and daughter train in FMA arts. That just really resonates with me. I think it's special. And so this is the first time for us covering this. And so we're definitely looking forward to this. And both Guru, we got Guru Robert Parks and Rebecca. And I'm going to be bringing them up shortly. And also, just some announcements. Please check out from the discussion. There's a lot of folks doing some seminars all over, geographically speaking, online and in person. Okay? Things are starting to open up. So check those out. You know, again, we said that we would announce events and all that, and we're going to be committed to doing that. In addition, raffle a week away this Sunday. All that money going to the uh, Ukraine refugees. And uh, we got some more. So if you haven't already, some really great prizes, great books, um, lessons, and some other stuff that's currently escaping me, having a senior moment. But nonetheless, there's some really good stuff in there. It's a great cause. Ten bucks a ticket, and you're helping people. So check that out. That's all in the pinned post on there. So easy to find. All you need to do is go on every discussion, go on the top, and write in the pinned post. And again, that's 6 o'clock. A week from this Sunday, we're doing the actual raffle. And without further ado, I'm going to be bringing up both Guru Robert and Rebecca Parks. And here we go. Good evening, guys. Thank you so much for coming on. How are you guys doing? Yeah, great. Thanks, Tim. And thanks for having yeah. us on. Oh, my gosh. Know. Happy to do. Happy to do. Well, and overdue. <laughs> so, yeah, and we got some folks jumping in. Folks, if you are watching, please tell us where you're watching from. Smash that like button. And we're just getting started. We got Dan from Pennsylvania. Man sent some great questions in. And we got Audie from North Carolina. All right. So, uh, again, you know, like I mentioned in the intro, this is our first time having, you know, father and daughter. So I'm really excited. I think there's nothing more just far as being awesome than you know a father and daughter training together i just think that's you know well goes beyond the bonding and all that but giving daughter you know realistic you know stuff as far as fma training and um I, I just think it's great what you guys are doing and um i think this is a uh a big moment sharing this you know with the community father and daughter I hope more will do this uh, my daughter trains she's a little on the younger side 14 you know um, but so maybe one day she'll be on here. We'll see. But uh, but at any rate, so um, you know, so let's you know some of these questions, as I indicated, are going to be you know for both of you and some for separate. So you know, you guys have both had some previous you know martial arts background, all that. But let's start with you, Guru Robert. Uh, what got you? Um, what got you into FMA? Um, well, I originally, uh, uh, to to be honest. Um, <laughs> I, um, and I don't really know how this happened, but uh, when I was um, 14, I somehow bought a Playboy magazine. And uh, in that, in, I know you didn't expect this answer. And, you know. <laughs> and in this magazine, I actually read an article. TMI. Um, <laughs> there, was a, there was an article on uh, martial arts in there. Um, it was about Chinese internal martial arts. So, you know, Shinji and Bakwa and Tai Chi. Um, and the, the school, yeah, it had a really cool name. Um, the God Dragon Society, and it was, uh, but it was, uh, it was in the city, and for me that would have been at fourteen, kind of getting on a train and getting home late at night, and sort of, you know, a big distance. So I looked in the local paper and found this uh, Wing Chun school, which had the tagline, you know, fight like the wind, which seemed really cool to, to a fourteen year old. So I started there, and um, and that Wing Chun school kind of had a, you know, like many, a bit of a affection for Bruce Lee and Jeet Kune Do, etc. And so um, in, that was in 1980. Um, and in 1982, um, Dean Insanto had come out to do some seminars. And so myself and my instructors attended that. Um, and that kind of was the initial, um, I suppose, the moment where I really fell in love with FMA, right, like mm -hmm. with, was through those seminars. Um, and then uh, FMA kind of got incorporated into the, the training in the Kung Fu school. It was never, we never were formally kind of studying FMA in that sense, but, mm -hmm. but it became part of the weapons curriculum of the school. Um, and then... Uh, I know, I saw that. Louis <laughs> <laughs> asking, oh, I'll send it to you, Louis. Um, yeah, Louis no, Playboy. 
so um yeah so that that was my initial experience and then uh i had a kickboxing match at 18 or something like that and then i ended up um studying in the bujin khan for about you know almost a decade and really came back to fma um sort of at the end of that period where i studied some modern anis uh and then there was a, a a sort of gap when i um entered into my academic career had children um and then sort of re returned about seven years ago to um really studying fma as my kind of along with capoeira as my kind of principal um area of training oh wow so you had a, okay so you had a pretty significant break far as uh yeah. you know time off which obviously life takes over and it happens i mean you know yeah. um can all be junkies you know there was, about, um, about a 10 year, there was about a 10 year break where i was doing my phd and um and we'd moved cities to because of universities and whatever and it was just too hard to start like i wasn't sort of uh didn't have the time to start again in a way um mm -hmm. like teaching and whatever um but i i i'd really been running a martial arts school since i was 18. um and sort of in some form or another whether it was initially the kung fu training which was sort of jick and do kind of style in a way and then mm -hmm. um later on um the, you know through the bujin khan kind of training which again the, the kind of appeal was the weapons right but i realized mm -hmm. i realized in that period that i kind of completely missed Edgar Sulate's, I've only realised this recently, that I completely missed Edgar Sulate's visit to Australia. Um, I missed the fact that Bobby Tabuata lived in Sydney for a while, you know, so because that was the period in which I was involved in Japanese martial arts and not FMA. Um, mm -hmm. And sort of pick up on those seminars and things like that. Um, so, you know, that's sort of a, like a little bit of a regret looking back, but, um, uh, but yeah, now I'm doing what I'm passionate about, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I'm going to get back to you just as far as like what resonated you from the experience and what you saw as far as differences in the other arts you trained. But before we do that, so Guru Rebecca, um, your first FMA experience, I'm going to take a wild guess here and say your father might have something to do with it, but just guessing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think there's a movie about some kid becoming a spy and not realizing that his dad's been training him the whole time to become a spy. Um, so we used to have party tricks when I was a kid where he'd come out and he'd be like, oh, let's show them who about a little bit. And we'd like do the trapping hands and played around with like some variations on that with some of the like Wing Chun type movements. Mm. Um, so I didn't formally start learning in a class until like five or six years ago um, when dad started teaching again. Um, so, yeah, that was my first experience of FMA was like just completely informal training. Yeah. So you didn't really, so pre that, you didn't really like do any like traditional martial arts per se or anything of the sort, I right? did yeah. yeah, so I yeah, had okay. two, okay. two or three classes of Wing Chun when I was 14, funnily enough, same age as dad. Um, but the teachers and I didn't resonate and I wasn't, I didn't get along with the other people in the class. They're all much, much older than me. And the friend I went with failed after the first class. So yeah. I made it like one more class after that and then went, uh, not sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's a big age gap and you're young. Yeah. I, mean, that, I mean, that alone can be, you know, I mean, so that can be frightening. <laughs> yeah, when all the teachers are male and you're a young female and they're talking yeah. about self-defense and I was like, self-defense is cool. I just want martial arts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So then I, I started Capoeira when I was 17 and so I've been okay. doing that for a bit over a decade now. We yeah. got a bunch of folks. We got Franz. We got ooh, Guru Louie from Canada, Maestro yeah. Alvin, Wayne, Steve. We got Sifu Guru Nathan. There's a Wing Chun guy. And then we got Terry from Stockton. Oh, all yes. right. All right. Yeah, folks, if you're watching, tell us who you're watching from. Smash that like button. All right. So back to you, uh, Guru Robert. So, you know, what were some of the like noticeable differences that you noticed coming from more the traditional martial arts? And now you're going to an art that's predominantly weapons like you know what did you um like things anything that particularly stood out as far as footwork anything just the weapons alone i mean I, I think because the original experience was with um the kind of innocento lineage there was already that kind of overlap with the jkd kind of philosophy so um i've all, i've all, i suppose um i would say philosophically two things that kind of uh, influenced me a lot were the idea of Musashi's kind of principle statement, you know, the, the way is in training and, um, and sort of uh, Bruce Lee's idea that, um, you know, no way is way, I suppose. 
And so those things kind of really shaped me originally. And so I kind of entered with a, a sort of already um, a sort of functional functionalist mindset. Like I was, uh, when Beck was 18, no, 16, 16, she fitted into my, my kickboxing pants that I fought with like in um, when I was 18. So like I was always really small and thin and um, redhead and freckles. And in Australia, that means you get picked on, right? So, um, <laughs> so that, that equation means you will be. <laughs> yeah, the redheads are, redheads are de mate, especially male redheads are definitely a target in Australia. So females too, but um, there's all sorts of like horrible nicknames. And um, so <clears throat> that was sort of my experience. Um, like I, I suppose I had a kind of both a philosophical interest and a kind of functional interest to, as well. Um, and then um, I suppose the thing about FMA that attracted me, and, and and I suppose it's why I kind of went to the Bujinkan later uh, for a while, was the, the kind of philosophy and, and the weaponry. I mean, I, I think I kind of always had an interest in that. Um, mm -hmm. But actually, I'd say the thing that really drives me around weaponry is that it's a really excellent vehicle for teaching strategy. Um, so, so, yeah, and I, and I find like, a, um, I mean, this is not so much about the early period, but sort of later, the, my interest kind of in um, weapon based kind of training is that I can kind of do that without losing as many brain cells, right? Like if we're, if we're kickboxing, you know, <laughs> and you're sparring all the time, you know, you, there's a decline that's kind of potentially going on, right? Yeah. Whereas at least with the weaponry training, we can train, we can still train hard and, and focused and spar and whatever without actually losing brain cells. Um, and mm. that's sort of a, a strong appeal, but but definitely as a vehicle, I've always seen myself in terms of, as a teacher, as um, using the technical as a vehicle for teaching strategy. Um, but I'll come back to that later, because I'm sure, I know you've got some other things you may ask us around that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, interesting, interesting. So um, we'll, we'll give you kind of a similar question, Guru Rebecca. Um, what do you see far as, you know, for the folks that are watching, like, what would you give far as, you know, well, two part question. One, you know, why weapons? What intrigues you about it? What it keeps you motivated training it? And the obvious compare as far as Capoeira. Um, yeah, okay. So weapons, especially for me, again, small, small human and short arms. So <laughs> it equalizes the playing field as well. Like, so I can go against someone who is much bigger, much stronger and still have some version of like ability, right? And mm. the more skilled I become, the more access I have to repertoire and ability to take on that person. Um, the cool thing about Cup Weirder is it kind of also has a bit of that philosophy because the kicks are usually done through misdirection or walking the person into them. There's a lot of trickery going on. Um, mm. And it's got that as its kind of foundation that it kind of allows that to, again, kind of equalize the playing field. And it teaches it that way as well, like through the circle where they're they're playing each other. And lots of people talk about how we, um, we don't kick each other very much, but part of it's because you're dodging. And I feel like with sword work, it's the same thing. You don't want to get cut. So you can block, but dodging is the best like, mm. you know, a way to get out of it at the start. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how I see the similarities between those. Also, footwork is, like, 100% up there. Um, Capoeira is, like, very free in its footwork. We have mm. the jingle, that is the sway side to side. Mm. Um, and we've noticed, having done, like, particularly, like, Bernard Sester Carter's, his way of moving the feet and, like, having that kind of freedom to move around, to change direction is very similar. Yeah. yeah, I'm fascinated with it. Um, I just got too much going on, but uh, the jingas and all that. I mean, it's fascinating to watch. I mean, I you know I, I love watching it, and um, if it's something if I had more time for, it, I would like to investigate it further. But it'd be just putting some, another pot on the stove that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that wouldn't really go anywhere. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so what? Um, okay, so. All right, so you get back into the game, Guru Robert. Was you know you had some time off there. So what um what system did you get back into as far as FMA goes? Yeah, so so um uh so it's about seven years ago, and um actually I like I teach at the University of Newcastle, and um there was a lot of um 
uh, either PhD students I had or colleagues I had whose husbands were kind of of a similar age, you know, mate, most of them a little bit older than me or or a couple a couple sort of in their thirties and a bit younger. Um, and uh, and so I initially just started a kind of um, uh, you know I just I called it Carly and I called it Carly very specifically because. Um, not because I believe that that's the original term or anything. Actually, historically, I think you know that's uh, mythology. But but because um, I really like the fact, and I think it's been on your program that the that Kali is a really good term to describe Filipino American martial art. You know, so so fama, if you like, right? So to a great extent, I felt like what I was really teaching was fama. You know, it was really uh, um, at this point it was kind of uh, based on the inner standard training. Had had some influence of the modern Anis. Um, I, I uh, then sort of reached out over time. Initially, actually, that's where it started. Um, I was also teaching a little bit of um, the Japanese sword and staff work um, that I knew as well. Um, the the staff work that I, I staff is a really favourite weapon of mine, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, the the system that I learned in the Bujinkan that is called um, Kuki Shindenru Hapo Hiken Jutsu, which translates as the nine devil gods tradition of using concealed blades, which is kind of an awesome, you know, <laughs> title. And uh, and it has a lot of, um, it uses a sliding action to kind of create power. Um, okay. but, it, but it also um, has some of the locks and whatever that we use in um, FMA. Um, however, the blades are often concealed inside the canes so that once you've done the lock and you've got the person locked, you withdraw the blade and then, you know, you could use the blade or whatever. Mm. So, um, so I was sort of teaching based on that kind of stuff and then sort of reaching out like, you know, uh, what what wasn't in existence in 1980s when I started was the internet, right? And and so, you know, I was looking at Piketty Tertiary, I thought that was a really well-structured system um, and then got very attracted to um, the sign Corto Cadena, a screamer, um, and uh, Myers, Myers Solderholm's book, um, uh, The Lie, the Cheat and the Thief, um actually i found really great and um again because it had that kind of strategy as the primary focus mm. from that. so so again that's sort of where i was centering my teaching was sort of strategy first um and utilizing from my japanese martial arts training a kind of five element theory so um you know sort of earth holds its ground water kind of um is tactical tactically evades and then comes back in fire put keeps the pressure on um wind wind is kind of evasive um, and then the void is your ability to switch between them right and so I kind of use that as a template um, uh, strategically but uh, technically with using FMA skills so that's where we that's sort of where we started seven years ago and then yeah and then it kind of changed over time um, the couple where I started a couple where of the year after that like um, uh, I did the classic thing where my couple where friends back at like you know my daughter and uh, one of our friends I was saying, I'll start it when I get fit. And they were saying, no, you'll get fit starting it, right? You know, and, and they were right because, you know, fitness is sport specific. So um, so I actually started doing capoeira. I'd put on weight, you know, doing my PhD and whatever. So um, so this was sort of a way to get back into it. And, um, mm, okay. and, then, and then that it's really that that led us to the uh, VSCK because we, it, we, because we noticed the um, similarity in there. A pendulum is very similar concept to the jinga and my <laughs> expresses that in a book um and then we had i had some interaction with her online very little bit you know and then um friends who's on hi friends um we later on met him in you know this is now going ahead a fair way but we met him in um the philippines for a chat um and then did a session with guru mario so we, we kind of um you know flirted with it if you like right and that became yeah. part of what we were teaching yeah but the, but it's not yeah. shifted since um going to the philippines yeah yeah it's interesting, you know, the you know, the comment you made about Fama and you know, Kali, um, that you know, they did we had a couple of extensive shows on that and the and the presenters were I thought they did a good job, you know, kind of you know, distinguishing between the two. And I think they're I think it's relevant. I think it exists. And yeah. you know, it doesn't mean that's negative. No. I just think there's two different entities that coexist. Um, and um, the it's whole thing with the word Kali. Yeah, I mean, I kind of like it, you know, whether it's yeah. used there, or it's founded, not founded, or whatever, you know. But I get, you know, each to their own. But it, I tell you, that can 
they, you know, that could be controversial. I'm yeah, so we did call ourselves Carly Newcastle for a long time, uh, and then yeah. that, that's sort of more recent. But we shifted to Screamer Academy because um, because uh, we wanted to signal a difference in how we now were approaching the training and what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And um, and so we kind of you know while the FAMA background is kind of the the roots of what it did. In fact, when we went to when we went to the Philippines, we were in the cab with uh, Paulo going to Lineta. And um, it was the first time we'd met him. And Paulo asked me the question, so what exactly is your FMA background? Because he'd been watching my videos online and he kind of had a sense of what we did. But he couldn't tell, right? Like the signature wasn't clear to him um, because he could see, if you like, multiple languages being expressed in our movement, right? Which okay. you know, the way I think about it. Um, it. You know, and so, or if you like, we were speaking with a dialect, you know. And, um, and so I realised now, um, well, you know, after... I could see why he couldn't see it, right? And there was things we were borrowing from left, right, and centre. Um, but but we made a kind of concerted effort to establish a kind of base, and and there's other reasons for that. Like when we get onto the systems, we can explain that a little bit about why we've done that. Sure. So, what made you before? I I, I want to touch upon the trip for both of you to the Philippines, but what made you seek out the compo? And uh, Bernas Estacadas. What? You no. Know, what was the what was the interest? Or there's some. Did you see something that? And we can actually, because you're both doing it. I mean, correct? Yeah. yeah. So I agree with Rebecca. What? Uh, what was the attraction to both systems? Um. So initially, we were just like looking at what's out there, which was also how we found the SCK. But um, so the Campo popped up because it had an online course, and so we bought the online course and. Had a, a little look at it, and we knew we were going to the Philippines um, on our way to another Capoeira event. Capoeira event in Switzerland, which is not really on the way, but it worked out well. Um, and so, like, we had a look at it before we went and, you know, did a little bit of practice, um, but we thought it was a good opportunity to make connection over there. And I think uh, Ray, is it Ray? Uh, yeah, Ramondo yeah, Ramon Lucero. Yeah, yeah okay. he was our initial link and then he was like oh you want to be in touch with Paolo he's the guy that organizes it all um and so we ended up meeting up with Paolo in um, Manila and like spent a week just intense training to Campo 123 original and we we knew we didn't want to go over there and try all the schools because I think like there was a bit of us that went we wanted to try and dedicate ourselves yeah, well, to well, too. yeah um yeah, so that was how we got into the campo. And when we were there, it was just such a feeling of like, this is so different to what we've done before. Um, I myself, like previously, would only ever really uh, like sword spa or knife spa techniques. Um, and it was the first time where I went, oh, I feel really powerful with this stick. Um, I feel like I can mm. actually like crack a bone with it um, because of the way they use their, their strikes in the casting and whatnot. Um, so, that kind of solidified our brain in our brains to go well we want to really kind of develop our skill in this and because it is so distinctive as well which made it nice to train like mm. as something completely different um as always your brain gets a bit bored if you do the same thing over and over again so something to challenge you was always nice um and then we didn't uh get to know bernas as grandmaster bernas until another a uh, year after that it was he and Paolo were working together on the Estacadas online course. And so, again, we, we, we took a look at that. And because of our connection through Paolo, we were supporting that. Um, and then we had him run a workshop for us um, online, just as like a one-off. Um, okay. And immediately, like the footwork and the way the strikes were going, the way the system looked like it was being set up, um, we realized that this would have a uh, way to kind of authenticate what we're doing before, but also give us a really useful and unique language for it. Um, mm -hmm. And what Brunas does really well is that he keeps a consistent um, language throughout his entire system, which we didn't know at that point, but we do now. And it's just like, yeah, it's a really cool way to set it all up. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, so I mean, um, that's right. Like Ray Lucero had put out a, a nag for the online course um, which I think was in a Dog Brothers forum or something. I, I, maybe one of them shared it. I'd I'd seen it online, and okay. that uh, and I really liked the way he was describing what it was. Um, I I got to say because we knew we had this opportunity to go to the Philippines, um, and I think we were there for actually about ten days, yeah. and we trained every morning with Paolo 
until it got too hot basically to you know to continue um in during the day so it was, we usually started like 8 8 a.m in the morning and then kind of finish around you know midday basically and mm. um and then um uh yeah, I think Paolo deliberately hid Grandmaster Benas from us while we were there. Um, and as Beck said, we just we decided not to do what they call in the Philippines FMA hopping, right? Which is where you kind of you know jump around, get a photo, yeah, you jump it, right. come back, you know, as if you're an expert in seventeen different traditions or whatever. We decided I'm not knocking that, like that's a that's a certain kind of trip, you know. But um, but we were on a kind of little sort of more of a pilgrimage, I suppose, right, to kind of study something in depth. Um, and the camera appealed for that reason because we knew it had a kind of finite curriculum. Um, and as Beck said, what, what we've discovered with Benas Estacadas is that, um, and he, as he says, it's very complementary to other systems. He, um, everything we had already been doing, and I'd been trying to structure, my students got annoyed with me with endless re restructuring of the grading criteria because I was trying to fit everything in, you know, and think, how do we do this? Mm -hmm. and um, whereas Benas has done it, right? Like I look at what Benas has done, Grandmaster Benas has done, and I just go, I love that. It speaks to me. That's exactly what I was trying to do. Um, He's and, cooked the meal. You don't need to cook it again. Yeah. <laughs> His grading system is based on uh, ripening a fruit. So you start unripe and you become ripened, right? And um, and then he was discussing with us recently the idea that his system's already cooked, right? You don't have to you don't have to you don't have to do anything to it. You can kind of eat it as it is and then sort of digest it and then offer it to others. And that's true. So he has this kind of core this core curriculum that keep as Beck said, it kind of keeps repeating um, when you switch from solar bust on to double bust double bust on to spider and dagger, etc. And and it does that in a way that a lot of a lot of FMA systems say they do. But there's a real, it's hard to explain, but there's a real kind of strength in the kind of language really truly repeating itself through the curriculum. Um, and he's, it, yeah, I mean, his, his pedagogy is really interesting too, which we can talk about too, but um, it, it really is a sort of pedagogy of discovery. Yeah, you know, what I'm, <clears throat> what I'm also indirectly hearing from you guys, you guys seem to, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, and the reason why I'm bringing this up because it's very similar to a path I followed. In the beginning, I was with some bigger systems. And for a multitude of reasons, um, they just didn't resonate. And every system I've been with now in status quo, current, smaller systems, um, again, I, I just like them better. I just, for, you know, for many reasons. And when I listen to your journey, kind of as sound blend, and now, you're kind of like falling down to you know smaller. Is that is that accurate? Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. From yeah. generalists to specialists. Yeah. And I think, and I think as Beck said, when we when we picked up DeCampo, we suddenly realised there was things that were um, really missing from our previous FMA training um, that just hadn't been taught. You know, and and um, and it's hard to see if you don't know what to look for. No. So, so uh, like a little example is um, the positioning of the wrist, you know. So you can, you know, we talk about being in ab abiota in an open position or serrata closed position, but um, not every instructor will talk about um, being in the a supine position in the wrist and a, a prone position in the wrist. And mm -hmm. so you can be, you know, supine in, uh, or hyan in um, abiota, or you can be um, kulub in abiota, you can be um, hyan in, in serrata, or you can be kulub in serrata. And that seems trivial, but actually what happens is um, it really starts to um, uh, have different ways of generating power, etc., because of this kind of um, uh, switch in the wrist. And mm. um, that's something we can demonstrate later. That actually it's really, really critical to the system, actually. Yeah, you know, I agree with you. I, I think what happens with a lot of and I, I don't think it's with malintent. I think the bigger these systems get, they have to really cater to seminar format training and all that because of the wide range of people. Now they're all over the globe. Um, you know, this has been my experience. When you go to the smaller system, there just seems to be more acute detail into stuff like that. And um, it's been my experience. And again, I, no fault of anybody. Uh, I just think it's just a, uh, just the way it is, you know? You know? And uh, so you guys, you go to the Philippines, I mean, you know, in short, like that must have been an experience. I mean, you you, you kind of spoke on already how uh, we got a little hot there, but so <laughs> so well, we take we take a bottle of water to. Or Becca take a she take a I bottle take of water. water. 
to the training. And I'd have, I'd have like five leaders, you know, that I'd carry because um, like I was just like, you know, I sweat more than she does anyway, but um, but I was sweating like a pig, you know, like <laughs> it was um, super hot. And we changed sometimes the location and some would be more or less in the sun, um, depending. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, the heat is pretty dry where we were in Manila. Um, so it wasn't terrible. Like, you know, some, oh, okay. of, the, some of the heat here in Australia, and I assume in other parts of the Philippines could be more humid, but um, and certainly different times of the year. We were there just mm -hmm. after Easter. Um, so, so basically, this time, two thousand nineteen, um, more or less, or just be, actually April two thousand nineteen, and um, and so it was, you know, pretty dry heat. It was okay in that regard, but um, yeah, I mean, it was. Uh, um, one of the interesting things I think was just you know we talk we talk a lot about and we experience this in Capoeira as well. There's a there's the culture of the country that produces the art, but there's also the culture of the art, and you can you know you can be um you know an american or an australian or you know uh, whatever hispanic you know a, a spaniard whatever you you'll have your own culture right mm -hmm. um and you can experience the culture of the art and you can you can express the culture of you know ki or or um Pekiti tertia or whatever um uh, and that is somehow kind of beyond the culture of the country but when you experience the culture of the country you also get something else right the culture that the art came from and it's hard to pin, but there's, uh, I once read this thing about, um, Beck might, you know, she might add to this, but I once read this thing about Filipino people being the nicest guys you'll ever kill you, <laughs> right? And, uh, and it was it was a reference to kind of the Bolo men or Manila men, right, you know, and their kind of capacity with um, blades and whatever. And but, but there's this kind of real thing, when we're walking around the street, you've got this constant thing of, hello, sir, hello, ma'am, you know, um, that's going on all the time, right? So there's this real kind of respect culture and this mm. definitely among Filipino martial artists, um, and you see it on the forums. There is a, a, a kind of thing about respect, right, and how and how you kind of interact. Um, you know, we and because of our long, longer martial art experience and whatever, like you know, we never discussed. Um, you know, this is a tip to people, right? We never discussed grading ever. Like when we were with Paolo, um, we just simply said, you know, we're here to learn the system, and um, and he was the one who eventually brought it up. Um, and I think that there's a lot of people who kind of see something like DeCampo and go, um, okay, I bought the course, can I be graded now? You know, like, it, which is not the same yeah. thing. As, you know, Paolo would say that your movement is your certificate, right? And mm. so at the end of the day, you'll get graded when you can, when everyone looks and goes, yeah, that guy's DeCampo, right? Or whatever, you know, like that was the sort of logic. And Benas has the same philosophy. Yeah, 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 yeah. No argument yeah. there. And, um... So Rebecca, they, so any highlights from the experience there or no? Yeah. <laughs> we experienced our first earthquake in the shopping mall. Um, <laughs> no, I was just, just thinking actually while you're talking, um, I, I mean, one thing that I really respected was that I, when we showed up, Paolo was very res, like responsive to where we both were at. So at one point we we're doing the double sticks in high school at the campo and um, dad, <laughs> really struggled with uh group nine which goes a bit like redonda the like it's like a sin it's a sin a while but yeah. it's but it's broken at the start um and i remember my brain it's been very wired towards patterns because of music and dance and doing the patterns when i was very very young um so i got that one quite quickly and i remember Paolo going oh cool so we'll move you on and he'll stay here and i remember thinking, <laughs> that's, like, oh my god that's cold <laughs> Yeah. I'm sorry, you never stay here though. Yeah, yeah. You the keep fact, going. You the keep fact that she brings it up on uh, you know an international podcast. Yeah, uh, of yeah. Well, by the way, yeah, but thank you. <laughs> he still hits harder. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, but it's just one of those things where, as a small young female, going in and being respected for what I can do, and not being told, oh, you like you need to practice this so much so that then you can beat this really big guy over here or something like that. You know, like it's yeah. I find. Filipino martial arts in particular is very good at kind of going like, how are you moving? Yep, that's good. Okay, we're all good. It's not um, assuming anything. Uh, yeah. yeah. One, one, one thing we loved about Polo was actually he was very good at catching you doing the right thing. <laughs> so um, so when you were when we were training, he would say um, something like, um, yes, that's De Campo. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, or he would be thinking out loud about his pedagogy because there was a point where my arm was too, hitting too wide and he said, close your armpit. So I closed my armpit and, and did the move. And he said, 
um, ah, so closing the armpits, the thing that's, you know, he goes, that's to Campo and then thought to himself, closing the armpits, the thing. So he was kind of um, very uh, reflective on what he was doing there, right? Which we really appreciated. Yeah, um, yeah, I've heard nothing but great things about him. I mean, so um, um, we got a question here. What's a good, okay, same. we'll get, we're going to type Franz's question at this. Okay. Um, okay, the two systems, now that there's some similarities, um, you know, I, I guess com some compare and contrast between the two, you know, similarities, differences. Guru Rebecca, you want to go ahead, start? After you <laughs> just put your father under the bus? <laughs> no, <I'm just> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the camp obviously uh, emphasizes the kind of like uh, horse stance rather than like a forward stance or a back stance. It uses them, but I think that's not its uh, initial starting point. Um, and definitely like more, well, I don't know, it's so tricky because I think they both cast with the stick because if you're thinking like a stick art, corners, mm. has corners <laughs> in the movement. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, so uh, we did. We have found some overlap in the footwork, but yeah. but Decambo has a kind of, um, as Beck said, a square stance. Mm -hmm. And later on, we'll, we'll demonstrate at least um, our perspective on it, right? Because it's mm. when you're dealing with that kind of curriculum and whatever, um, everyone will tend to take away, and also because of their previous training and whatever, um, they'll kind of bring their own filters to what they learn, right? Um, and one of the great things about us training the Philippines together was that when we came back, um, we'd be teaching our students stuff and, and they could say, no, that's not how that one goes. Or I'd say, you know, no, you should, your wrist should be like this or whatever. And so um, so there's this kind of, um, uh, like we could, we could kind of add to each other's knowledge and correct any sort of differences or whatever, or, or at least, you know, just sort of make us think about, well, okay, maybe that is the way that was or whatever. And um, so that was really helpful. Um, but one of the things that Beck just mentioned, so Benas, Grandmaster Vanas has this great kind of um, concept, which he talks about um, stripes having either corners or no corners. Um, and again, we'll, we can show this later in the demo, but um, but one of the things is that he said, when you when you hit with a stick uh, when, or an impact weapon, um, you should see corners. In other words, like um, you'll have this kind of like snap in the kind of um, hitting of things, right? And and then the movement will continue. So, you, so you'll get this kind of like bam, bam, bam. And one of the things you notice about DeCampo is that it does have an element of that insofar as if you're doing something like a Sinawali move, um, it's not done like blah, 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 like this, but it's done like boom, 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 boom. You know, so every strike mm -hmm. is kind of distinctive, right? Um, and that kind of signals it's, to him watching it, he would go, that immediately signals it's um, uh, stick, stick orientation, right? Uh, whereas a blade will, like, you know, moves, can move smoothly, right? So one of the interesting things is that in DeCampo, there is this kind of action, like, um, where it seems like almost like a wand. Um, and uh, and I think in, a, in the warm-up chat, I was mentioning that um, if you look in David Gould's book, um, he inherited the, um, or he, he I think he um, purchased through, like, a, a kind of big yeah. or whatever the, the the weapons of the still remain of jose caballero and um mm -hmm. and one was the founder of decampo and one was a um like a stick uh rattan stick that's sort of tapered at the end um and he so got that and one with the hold in it with the with the rope yeah, yeah with the yeah with the wrist tied yeah, yeah. 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 so um yeah so uh yeah and that <laughs> that in itself is really important you can't see it now but you might be able to see that I don't know if it shows up. Yeah. That my hand, I've got a callus here, right? Um, that when you do the campo and when you do it in a hot climate like the Philippines, your hands are and you do it intensively, your hands are wrecked by the end of the week, right? Like literally, we had we had we were taping after the second yeah, day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we had blisters that were exploding and whatever, right? Um, because because of the way the strikes are done um, and you know sweat and everything else, but you your stick starts to slide. So one of the things you'll often see in a decampo practitioner is they might start with a really big punyo because as they get faster, as going, it slides out. Yeah, <laughs> and so obviously Jose Cabrera had a way of fixing that, right? Which was to um, the chain the stick to his wrist, basically. Um, but the tip, uh, uh, there's a story about him, um, you know, cutting cutting a guy's arm in a Wego Toro competition, um, and with it with the tip of his stick. And I think with that slightly tapered tip. 
um, and this kind of action, um, like it, 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 Benas would say this has no corners, right? Like it's a, there's no corners in the action. And, the, and so then the question is, if the stick art, why no corners? Well, maybe mm -hmm. that's because he was really trying to strike with the tip. And, it, and again, um, you know, I'll say this many times when I'm thinking about uh, De Campo, but it seems to me as a dueling system, it was designed to um, hit, hit fast um, and yeah, uh, make sure that uh, you kind of hit on the half beats between so that you're you're getting more strikes in than your opponent. Um, and yeah, and as Beck said, it, it does very much appear to be designed to kind of take apart other um, ways of moving. It's an initial kind of thing, right? Like it's, yeah. I remember our first phase in the Philippines and we were like, oh, this is just like Wing Chun's ability to take apart some of the other like boxing and stuff because staying on the come inside. Other, yeah. Yeah. Staying on the inside and we we're like, oh, this is like the Campbell's kind of the same kind of thing for FMA. And, I, yeah. and actually one thing we'd say that I experienced and I said it and I was really glad Paul knew the reference, um, it felt like Fa Jing with a stick. Yeah. Um, so in Kung Fu, you know, this is kind of, when you see Tai Chi and, um, yeah. and they kind of have this like bam kind of action or, you know, that sort of snap action. Um, that was my experience of De Campo, that it has this kind of like Fa Jing action to it um, in terms of the way it generates power. And, um, and I hadn't experienced that before. And that's to do with this, like um, you see this kind of uh, pulse in the, yeah. um, and and to do with the fact that the body and the stick travel together, um, so those things actually start to again we can demonstrate the stick later, but but it shows the kind of um, it it creates this kind of like exactly like any of the guys who do kung fu as well. Now this is kind of like um, hinge action in a lot of kung fu. Mm. It's fascinating. I mean, you know, I've seen some of it just through the eyes of Mako. And, and all that, um, you know, the, the stomping feet, you know, just that, the, the throwing the tip, things that really and really resonate with me, especially on the recovery aspect. Um, I thought that was incredible. First time I ever that was brought to my attention as far as a tactic and how important it was. But, you know, I did hear about the tip where, like, you know, <clears throat> Jose, you know, GM Jose would literally throw the tip and cut like people's face, yes. body parts. I mean, just, yes. you know, some of the things that Dave has told me that he heard, you know, just from Edgar, you know, Edgar being, I guess, one of the favorite students, um, you know, I mean, this, that guy was just, was bad. <laughs> that guy was, uh, yeah, I just, uh, yeah, exactly. uh, let me just see if, I'm gonna just try to fit in uh, uh, this question here, okay. So his question is, how similar is GM Bernard's curriculum and grading to that of GM, oof, uh, Hortensio Navalis. Navalis? Okay. Oh, Hortensio. Hortensio Navalis, yeah. Navalis, um, okay. Yeah, so this is kind of an interesting question. Um, so uh, the, basically, Grandmaster Bernard's history is that his first training was with his grandfather um, and his uncle. And um, his grandfather uh, would... Um, go and drink, uh, I think he said coconut wine, um, and um, and would get a you know get a little bit of tips, tipsy, and then would say, um, "Who's going to come and spar with me?" Right, and his grandfather would have a, a walking stick, right, um, and he would and you know in, inevitably it was um, uh, Grandmaster Vanas who would sort of you know say, "Yeah, right," you know, so he would he would run and grab it, you know, he'd be sent away to grab a stick. And then his mm -hmm. grandfather would start kind of attacking him, right? Like with a stick and say, defend yourself, defend yourself, you know? Um, in fact, I think he said it started with the kind of thing they call boxing, but it, uh, boxing isn't just like sort of boxing. It's kind of what we would say is sort of like, um, you know, the kind of wrestle play you do with your kid, you know? And um, so it started that way, but became stick fighting over time. And in uh, the Negros region, um, if you if you see um, Wedo uh, de Cabareta, like for example, that's one assistant that's sort of in from the same region, and you'll see that they tend to use a longer stick, a topado as well, like um, oh, they okay. use a longer stick. Um, and so the walking stick was sort of part of that, and that's where it started for Grandmaster Benaz. Um And then later on he learned off his uncle, um, and his uncle was sort of famous um, for having um, anting anting, you know, like a, a kind of... Yeah. Um, impervious like a, a amulet power of, to be impervious to yeah. things and in fact he when he died they believe he was poisoned or and or um that basically this is um that he was killed by someone who kind of put a hex on him right 
So, yeah. um, so this is kind of story in the family, right? Like the, um, this is what happened. Anyway, that's where he started. And the reason I raised that is because that tradition that he started in is called, uh, in the area is called Wedel. Um, and, and a Wedel is like, um, somewhere between rough play with your kid and structured FMA. It's somewhere in this middle section, right? Um, and Wedel was the kind of thing where you could imagine that um, in the conflicts that happened between, like, say, Moro raiders coming up the coast and mm. you know, kidnapping people from the islands or whatever, um, and some people having skill in the village and saying to the um, younger people, okay, it's, if they attack, this is what you've got to do. So it started with things like saying, okay, um, you know, hit uh, uh, forehand, backhand, forehand, backhand, you know, and, and so you do that. Um, and then it might be, okay, you're going to hit up and down, hit, hit up and down, right? Um, mm. And then it, they wouldn't have names necessarily for these things, um, although this is, this is called uh, in the kind of locals would understand this is what wrong Peter, um, which means to break, right? And so it's like you're cutting up, but then the power comes from the downward strike, for example. So that was in, that's what he got in Weedle. And then, um, or some of what he got in Weedle. And then he, um, he encountered um, through a girlfriend, um, Potencio Novales, and, um, and he started uh, learning with him. And then later on, um, he, for college, he moved um, to Cebu, um, uh, where, where he studied, studied as a graphic artist. And then he didn't really complete that, but he came back to, um, to Bacolod in um, the island of Negros. Um, and it, I think it was, um, it's, it was either in Bacolod or, uh, or Cebu, I can't remember. He encountered, I think it was Bacolod, um, he encountered um, three guys that attacked him. And, um, and he fought off the three guys unarmed. But not long later, they returned with blades. And when mm. they returned with blades, um, he, you know, he ran away, right? <laughs> like as you would, because um, he wasn't armed at the time. And he really felt like that was lacking in his training. So then he went and trained with Hortensio Novales, um, who's okay. a very famous um, practitioner of FMA in the, on the island of Negros. And, um, and so uh, he had a thing called the Novales Arnis, Arnis Clinic and, um, and Grandmaster Van Alstein trained with him. And what he got introduced, and this is, I think, the really interesting part, what he got introduced to uh, by Hortensio Novales um, was uh, actually numbering systems. So prior to that, his FMA had had no numbering system, right? So no, it literally was, just do this thing, you know. Um, okay, you know, defend yourself like this, you know, whatever it was. Um, but then when he trained with Hortensio Novales, he got introduced to this kind of, you know, 12-strike 12, um, 12 numbering system. Uh, which he then kind of used to anchor his weight on. Um, so what he teaches isn't like, particularly in the obesidade or in the solar baston, the, the kind of basics in the solar baston, is his own own system that he mm. had kind of drawn on the inspiration of Hortensio Novales um, and the numbering kind of system, and then but applied it to the weight or knowledge that he had. And so what you get is this kind of really strongly elongo um, inflected Kind of FMA system um, that has a has a structure that the Weddell didn't, but it still deep down privileges the kind of Weddell way of training. And so, as an example, he would say that KI, um, or at least um, actually I should say differently, Tatang um, Illustrissimo actually taught in a Weddell style. And so, when you look at um, the fact that there's so many branches of KI and they've kind of got different things from their training with Tatang. Um, that he would say that's precisely because Tatan was teaching in Wedel style, right? So people had to say to him, what, you know, he didn't say, you know, here's this number and here's that. And he didn't have a structure, right? It, it was it, no, no, it was not systematized. Was no. Yeah. 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 And so that exact kind of, uh, you know, it's not, not all Wedels are the same, right, in that sense, mm -hmm. but, but, but they are the same insofar as they don't have a structure. And so, um, so uh, he would say uh, that, um, like Grandmaster Van would say, um, the KI is a really excellent example um, under Tatan of what Wado kind of was like, right? Mm. Um, now, the, what interests me is that I've always thought the numbering system probably came from the Spanish because the um, because obviously in Western fencing, European fencing, the, the parodies are all numbered, right? Um, so there's a kind of numbering system already there. And I just assume, you know, if you look at Asian martial arts, the, Chi the Chinese martial arts are like, you know, snake creeps down or you know, part of the horse's mane or whatever. The um, the Japanese are like functional, you know, outside wrist twist, you know, or number one number one wrist twist or whatever, you know. So, th so they're kind of very functional in that. 
but it's um, not until you get to FMA that there's this numbering, right? And uh, what I've kind of, as an academic kind of exploring this, and I've talked a little bit to um, uh, Felipe Giocano, uh, who kind of has a similar, you know, we've, we've kind of come to a similar conclusion, that it may well be that when America had um, was the colonial power in the Philippines during the 19, the interwar period between the First World War and Second World War, that they actually pulled a lot of people from the Philippines um, to the US, trained them as teachers and sent them back. And so you, what you get is this kind of influence of the American education system. Interesting. And so, okay. um, so I'm working on a project about this exact thing. I can't say definitively this is what happened, but, but, I, but it looks promising to me that this is what happened. And it's during that period that you start to get the influence of, of Western educational thinking progressive education mm. and it starts influencing physical education as well so suddenly you get in 1925 jose caballero structuring his system based on the system of american education right so from elementary high school college you get the number of, right? <laughs> yeah yeah and, and this is when when you look at the history that we can really say 100 percent um the systems are all arising um like the the original Lebanon fencing club is 1920 um, the, the split off later on with Dorsey Pares is, um, right. you know, 1930. Um, and it's not, and it's really not until like Belintuak is 1952 or something. Right. So it's kind of like the evolution is really occurring in the 20th century, um, on things that were probably more Wado like prior. And so Grandmaster Benas did not encounter numbering systems till 1980. Right. So, so actually when you consider that, that means that actually all of this training up until then have been this Wadel style. So I suspect yeah. there's a lot more Wadel kind of training that goes on and that um, in the Philippines and that the kind of numbering stuff became was a later kind of potentially American influence on FMA, right? Um, and anyway, I'm, gonna, I'm studying that to see if, if that turns out. No, that's right. fascinating. I, it makes sense yeah. though. I mean, it's, it's like um, particularly him to use, you know, the... <clears throat> elementary high school college you know numbering system i mean yeah that's why well, um so there's one more part i should add to friends question because that's sort of the base right but then mm -hmm. when we get to sparta Daga, the sparta Daga is strongly influenced by um the sparta Daga he learned from hortensio navales um the um and the doble baston is all like it's kind of somewhere in between right it's got definitely got influences of his um own uh, but also there's some influences of um, Hortensia Novalis as well. When we get to Estiquido, which is his unarmed system, um, uh, he certainly learned unarmed uh, techniques for handling knife, uh, you know, mm. knife from Hortensia Novalis. Um, but he also uh, has incorporated lots of other things. So he's, he's a black belt in Aikido as well, um, which he studied just because he wanted to understand how they handle things. Um, he's yeah. done a bit of praying mantis um you know uh sorry you man yeah yeah he's done tai chi he's a really good practitioner of tai chi as well um so um so he actually um has brought together those um other elements into his estiquito um so uh, so it's still consistent which we'll, we can demonstrate a little bit um yeah. where we're, only, we're only sort of at the point where we're just touching on estiquito with it right um but we can show a little bit later about how it fits with the rest of what he does and how that works. But that's the answer to Frank's question. There's definitely strong influences of, um, of Hortensio Novalis in certain areas. Um, there's a strong influence in terms of the numbering, but the underlying kind of guts of the system comes from this kind of weight of philosophy. And so as you, as you train with him, he says, you know, it starts st structured, but it becomes a path to freedom. So, uh, so he has drills which kind of force you to kind of explore and discover things for yourself. Again, I'll, I want to show you something about it with Opensa Defensa, one of his base drills later, which is very clever. Yeah, I'm just, you know, it's funny because um, me being a KI fan and all that, I'm wondering if Illichismo stuck to that, what would we see today as far as KI? Now, you know, that's got me thinking, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Might be stirring, I might be stirring up a freaking uh, hornet's nest here, but... Uh, <laughs> I know, I, I, it's very, I'm always nervous talking about other systems, but um, I think, like, in terms of Benassi Staccatas, it starts in this structured form and becomes more Weido-like, having been built on Weido in the first place, right? So this is kind of interesting um, kind of evolution, right, that happens mm -hmm. in the way 
way you train it. So you you know you could go from structure, of course, to free movement, which I assume everyone ultimately wants to do at some point. Or, or, or hopes to or should, I guess. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Question here with regards to sparring. Do you gravitate to one or the other, or do they kind of both come out, you know, pending yes, big yes. person, small person, <laughs> long person, you know, whatever? Yeah, I think sometimes it depends on what sparring game you're playing, because, of course, depending on the rules, are we doing stick spar, mm. are we doing sword spar, is it just open, are you just going for it? Um, and then who you're playing against, like, you know, if I'm going against Dad, I don't use to come for because he's much faster than I am. <laughs> <laughs> so That's I'll true. do more, more running away. No, um, I'll do more counter attack rather than um, trying to go blitz. As, as an example, yeah. that, that point. Yeah. Um, I I um, went into a kind of pass pass attack on her, right? <laughs> so I I basically kind of put the pressure on and then sort of exploded into kind of the pass pass. So so I'm moving fast and kind of multiple attack. And her timing is really good. And because of her music, she read what looked to probably other students like um, random movement on my part, um, she picked the timing and just went bam and got me, right? Um, like right in the middle of my strikes. So yeah, that's a good example of kind of a different, like she used a different kind of strategy completely. To gotcha, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, so then I think naturally I probably would normally do, if I wasn't thinking, it'd be closer to Estacadas. But uh, in saying that, like there's definitely times where, you know, I'll, getting close to the opponent and I'll sink and I'll think about doing like the pass pass yeah. to campo type movements. So I think sometimes it blends. I might try and hold myself to one or the other on a particular day. If we've just been training the campo, I'll be like, okay, hey, if we're sparring, I'm doing the campo because we've just been training that to try and reinforce it. But yeah. Yeah. And so, and so what, what we okay. tend to do is, what we tend to do is a teaching philosophy is whatever the lesson that um, like whichever system we've been focusing on the lesson, we encourage people to spar using what they've learned, right? But also, um, if it's if it's a uh, kind of um, like I call it micro sparring, you know, if you've got a certain kind of thing you're training in the sparring, mm. then that's very much the case. Sometimes in just free sparring, it's just like go for it, express yourself, okay. however, right? Um, however, in my my personal approach is that I tend to, um, for the most part have made a decision about which way I'm going to spar and I try to stick, I really try to work the language of that spar, like express myself through that system. So so there'll be times where I would very definitively spar in a De Campo style and there'll be other times where I've, you know, I really are aiming to spar in a Estacada's way. Um, and that's partly so that when I reflect on, you know, watching it, whatever, you know, I can kind of consider how successful or unsuccessful I was in kind of embodying that um, system. Occasionally, yeah, yeah, you can back reflect, see what you we need to work on, you know, yeah. when you isolate just one system. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I get that. Occasionally, it'll be a situation, though, where I'm sparring someone. Like, I might have decided I'm going to spar to Campo, say, and then they're, you know, they, they're nailing me left, right, and center. I just can't make it work, and I'll switch. <laughs> so, so yeah. um, you know, there'll be, you know, I, I would also use it that way, right? Um, but, yeah. I, but I think um, I try not to be unconscious about which system I'm using. Okay. You know, I, try, I try to, you know, think of it, think of it as a kind of, um, yeah, an exercise in um, kind of self mastery or something. Like that. You guys, uh, all right. So when you, you guys teach, do you guys keep the FMI system separate or do you lump them together? We keep them separate. <laughs> separate. Yeah. So yeah, I like that. Yeah. yeah so um, uh, we we were at one point really dedicating this night as X and this night as Y. But the mm. problem with that is that some students can only come on one night or the other. Yeah, and they're missing. Yeah. They're missing, yeah. So, so, uh, so what we've done, um, both uh, Paolo makes this point that um, teaching is learning. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we were encouraged from that very first sort of training with Paolo to when we returned to Australia, start teaching straight away because because actually that will help you understand and refine your knowledge, right? Which is mm. true. to remember. Yeah. And then, um, you yeah, know, and then it was probably, I don't know, it was like a year until we formally graded as instructors in the system or something like that. I'm not sure, like, what the time frame was. Um, but, um, and Benas has the same view. So he says uh, training in Benas Estacadas is 50%, um, like, training drills and whatever, and 50% teaching. Um, and it, because it's in the teaching you discover things. And literally, the thing I want to show you about Opensa Depensa, I discovered while teaching it. Like, it, it was to do with when, 
there's a counter strike movement in it and i always wondered why he put the counter strike where he did um and it became so obvious when i was teaching it why that was um so it, it was actually training the person to, to hit at the most vulnerable time with the opponent which is so so in fact the feeder was learning something if they were paying attention um they were learning something as well as the as the defender right um in the movement so so we do keep we do keep them separate um there'll, there'll be occasional times where um i might do like say a tactical class and in the tactical mm. class i'll say i don't care like unless unless i'm saying something specific about um this is how the campo sets up its tactic you know um uh, for example in the ele in the elementary curriculum of the campo um there's a sort of initial part which Beck has described, I think, nicely that there's uh, the seven seven uh, angles of striking and the seven blocks. Um, you, you don't really block into Campo that much, right? Like it's not really a, a thing, but you learn the kind of angles of striking by the blocking. But also the blocking, if you imagine, is like a payon, um, that like an umbrella. Then you you're often sort of blocking and hitting in the one action kind of thing. So that would be the mm -hmm. um, That's the first group like or you know what's called group one but but group two um involves hitting and kind of sticking and then pulling so hitting hitting by pushing and hitting by pulling um and then group three involves um a kind of horizontal strike that bounces and then is pulled through so it's kind of like and then same in reverse right so um so you have this kind of um uh hit hit like half strike and then get a second strike in before the other guys retract like while he sticks retracting by pulling, um, hit, and while he's retracting his stick or gone through, you're getting with the second one. Um, okay. The third, uh, fourth technique is um, you hit and then uh, redondo, um, or hit and redondo is the fifth technique, right? So both of those, mm -hmm. again, it's a hit and bounce, um, a half strike and, a, and then a full strike. So all of the elementary curriculum, more or less, if you, if you count the first one as full strikes, the rest is all half strike, full strike. And, and my theory of that is that as the foundation is that um, it sets up a quicker time, not of the first one, because what, however fast you can hit is going to be as fast as you can hit, right, in terms of the first strike. Um, but it's what happens after that strike. So if, um, you know, we can demonstrate this later, but but if Beck's like hitting me at that, at that moment um, and then she, her strike's going through um, and I'm pulling, I've hit her twice while she's still pulling back her weapon um or again like um if uh you know say um yeah so say say i've, I've hit her, her here or i'm about to hit this bounce and then she travels through and i hit i'm again hitting her while she's retracting her stick mm. um, so there's a definite logic in the base of the curriculum which um has that kind of uh logic of like setting up a kind of fast strike I, by the way i've got no idea how i got onto that um, so no, okay. okay. I forget what your question was. <laughs> Actually, though, let's get into the demo. Yeah. yeah okay. Sure. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll do it here. Here's the thing. I'm going to lower myself. So when you are done, I'll pop back up. Sorry. So um. In terms of if we start with the point we were just making, um, then the um, the initial uh, uh, we'll put group one aside because it because it is just the blocking part. But if you um, but if you look at the um, alpha video technique, which is group two, um, then you have this kind of like a initial half strike that sticks and then the pull. So if Beck was um, uh, yeah, if if, um, if I um, hit her here. Um, or even if I've missed, even if I've missed her, um, then then as she strikes, as you strike, uh, strike through. Yeah. So as she strikes through, I'm hitting as she's still got her stick retracted, right? Um, so I'm getting like um, two strikes for every one of one strike of hers. Um, another example, probably better example, because it, it's easier to see. Um, so I can kind of bait her with the initial movement of um, group three, right? So group three, if that puts up her stick actually straight. So group three has this kind of double hitting action. So then if I go like this, um, her 
a, a, her defense is already presented itself and then I get her with the second one, right? Um, or it might be that she has in fact successfully blocked me and then as she's going to get ready to hit back, um, I've got her again with the second one. So this is kind of like um, half strike. Um, the, the second strike is basically on a half beat. It's, it's actually hitting um, in, in the kind of um, half zone, right, between the, between the strikes. Um, so that can demonstrate it on here. Like, so if you demonstrate, <laughs> demonstrate the, um, like the, the basics, like the four, like group two, three, four, yeah, five, yeah. The group two is the hit and the pull. Group three is the bounce and then come through. That's the first time I've hit the wall. All the other marks are him. <laughs> group four again is half strike here, half strike on the other side. Or you can do the faster version, which is here, and then cuts on the same side. And then same abierta, so here, on the other side, fast track the other, or on the same side. And so, um, in terms of um, the kind of uh, setup, if you like, um, if I go to hit that with this strike, um, and she she then wants to uh, go to my hand, like so he's taking the snake. Um, so as she goes for my hand, um, I'm, I've already got a, a position which, as it comes, I'm already kind of got a perfect counter for that, right? And so eventually you want it to be seen. You want the first strike to be seen or even to hit. Like, so if she doesn't block me, that's great, I get her. Um, but if she does block me um, or goes to block me, then I can get it straight away. And then eventually these kind of blur, right? So the idea is to kind of make, you know, two strikes, one. So you get, so I'm still like hitting and hitting, but but it's done like super fast. And of course, the, the plus plus action helps that as well. Um, so that's one thing in the basics uh, that kind of, I think shows his kind of emphasis on, uh, Jose Caballero's emphasis on kind of hitting fast. Um, one, of, one of the other interesting things before we compare it to oh, Estacadas, or we can compare it like say to other systems. One thing you notice, and I mentioned before about the Hayong Kulub, Hayang Kulub <laughs> action, um, um, that's my Australian accent, sorry, Paolo. Um, so um, uh, when you when you strike, unlike many systems which kind of pull their strikes um, and then sort of rotate back into a chamber up here or whatever, um, De Campo lets the, it doesn't arrest the motion of the strike. So you have this kind of like fully um, fully expressed kind of strike as you strike through, um, and the wrist just turns out into um, into high end, right? And the same if you're going. Uh, from Abiyo to, to Serrata, um, as you strike, the wrist will change into Kalul. So again, a lot of systems would sort of do that um, and you know come back for the other strike or whatever. Um, but again, in De Campo, there's a kind of movement which is to sort of arrest, or like in this case, to kind of fully express the motion um, through, right? So so you get this kind of action um, where the wrist, wrist sort of turns. One other thing that's really noticeable um, in De Campo is the peak pick, right? And there's been, I know there's been a bit of discussion on the FMA forums about this. Um, so, do you want to do a bit of a okay. hands up? Yep. So, um, so, one thing you notice with Beck um, Giga Carenza, firstly, there's this kind of uh, like oscillation in the movement. Um, we, if you film De Campo from above, you see this kind of pulse, um, pulse in the movement, and you also see um, this kind of like rocking kind of action um, in the when you're performing the kind of basic movements and whatever. Um, and that um, that pulse, I, I think it'd be great if everyone out there films their FMA system with a um, a drone camera um, and looks down and sees what we are, what what kind of pattern is it kind of creating because. It was really instructive for us to see that the Campo has this pulse. Um, and it, again, it looks very different uh, to Esther Carter's because um, he back demonstrates <laughs> yeah, you know, um, a bit of like kind of um, Carenza with Esther Carter's or something. You know. Be mindful not to hit walls here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So 
So you notice, um, firstly, no pick pick, right? Um, so you don't hear the slapping. Um, and uh, the other thing is um, you'll see this action um, Q, uh, called QR, where you use your body to actually help um, accelerate the stick. Um, so the pick pick, there's been a lot of discussion about, and I, I've certainly um, expressed my own views about this before. But if you've used, ever used a nunchaku, um, the nunchaku has to kind of wrap before it comes forward. And if you can create a pick pick, uh, or, or a, a barrier for your stick to kind of respond to that's in front of your chest, right, then you've got like, instead of coming all the way into your back um, in order to go forward, it's now somewhere out here, which again means you shorten the distance between the first strike and the second strike. Um, so pick pick, in my experience, it does accelerate the initial strike, but usually the pick pick is happening after you've already hit the target. Um, so in this case, um, uh, actually, I think what really is going on is that acceleration is helping what happens to the next strike. There has been also discussion about it keeps your hand, you know, sort of in check and you're not kind of leaving your hand out there and all that kind of stuff. It definitely does that too, but um, but I think there's a kind of beauty in DeCampo in terms of um, this kind of, uh, like, open, opening and closing. There's this sort of balance that's always going on between both hands. So, there, so the hand is all either... Um, Pick picking or it's took mudding, you know, so it's it's pushing um, the opponent away. Um, as Beck demonstrated with estacadas, the estacadas movement um, is, you know, it's, in some ways looks similar to other FMA styles, but um, the really key thing is the footwork. So there's so there's this constant um, kind of like um, uh, moving from almost like one stance to another um, initially, but then that becomes uh, like again if you think about it in a weight or fashion. Um, then uh, one of the one of Grandmaster Vanessa's favourite movements, if I'm allowed to say that, um, is uh, two and two and three in his system. So this action is three. Um, this action is two. And so one uh, one example would be this kind of action. So so you're actually um, hitting up and hitting down. Um, and that could be you know that could be a kind of a, attack you make. Um, or uh, you might like you know uh, strike down and thrust, strike down and thrust, um, which would be seven and eight. So what happens is you start to combine the numbers. Um, so he has a method of kind of uh, putting putting the striking together and um, building up the numbers. And in that way, there's a similarity with DeCampo because DeCampo um, at its college level has seven kind of techniques, um, and then it puts those techniques together uh, initially in a kind of consecutive order, um, and then post kind of instructor level um, in the specialization course, those techniques go together more randomly. So um, so in that way, it's a bit like boxing. There's a kind of finite set of techniques. Um, and then you just put those techniques together um, in combinations. And then later on, you'll sort of move away from set combinations to kind of free free form movement. So, um, so um, we have like, um, this, this is a, a seven techniques all put together. Um, so you'd have one, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven. Um, but then you could do um, in the advanced uh, kind of curriculum, um, and I know Paul's put this out on video already um, publicly. So if Beck chose, for example, uh, uh, one, five, six, four, seven, yeah. So, so now the combinations of the strikes are put together in an unusual pattern, right? Um, and some of those patterns recur in the kind of system and teach you interesting things. Um, but also it means your opponent can't ever be really sure what uh, set of patterns, just like a boxer, can't be super sure about which kind of set of combinations you're going to put together. Um, it can be put together in all sorts of uh, different different ways, right? So, um, so that's the... Um, I suppose a little bit about um, uh, kind of DeCampo's movement. Um, I'm happy, to, like, if people want to ask questions in the chat, we can respond to that more specifically. Um, again, you would have uh, actions like uh, if if deck was sort of shaped up, and I um, I could I could use that serrata technique in horizontal. So this this is the serrata technique that I demonstrated before. So we um, so we can it starts uh, DeCampo starts very strongly on controlling your angles so you start really working diagonal initially um, and then later on um, you, you or then you also work uh, horizontal specifically but then you can kind of um, mix and match if you like so the serrata technique that's like this um, becomes like a technique 
um, done in the horizontal as well. You want to add anything to that? Or no? <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, so that's like a key, uh, one of the key principles. Um, there, there's a definite feeling I, I have when I do Decampo of immediate interception. So, um, so the idea is that the second that person moves, so we're a little bit distant, yeah. So, so I immediately would uh, go for the counter. And then you might use a technique like the, um, you know, seven, to come to break in and to, uh, you know, kind of overwhelm the person with, um, with strikes, etc. In, in um, uh, Estacadas, uh, if we demonstrate um, a little bit of the, you want to do this part of so, um, let's move this out to me. So, um, just to give you a bit of a feeling of how uh, it sort of looks different um, in that regard, uh, Beck's going to demonstrate a little bit of the spider dagger of old um, banana sister cutters. Um, actually, I need to have a book. <laughs> I was waiting for it. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, so um, so what would happen is um, there's a certain series of strikes that are used in um, estacadas, and then they become a kind of basis for exploring kind of more freeform movement. So, so that's um, a bit of an example of the Spartan dagger of the system. Um, it's, in my experience, um, kind of unlike many of the other um, systems you see doing a Spartan dagger, because often they're um, kind of in very, like very formal patterns of movement. Um, but what happens in um, Benassi staccatas is that uh, from the abyssidata you've already learnt with the stick, uh, that forms a basis in this case of my attacks. Um, and Beck's initial defence. Um, but then uh, it introduces the Gunting um, and uh, uh, really has an emphasis on um, the Otso Otso movement and the Crossada movement. Um, and the, you know, obviously the dad coming in out. That part's often similar, I think, to other systems in a way. Um, but this is particularly, um, this kind of way of training is particularly uh, something that we understand um, that Grandmaster Vallas was influenced from Potencio Novales. Um, so that's another uh, aspect of it. Um, what else do you want to show? Um, <laughs> uh, you offensive pencil? Ah, yeah, thank you. That was, I did want to show that. Um, so, um, so one of the interesting things, again, like in terms of, um, say, Bernard Sestacadas, um, is the kind of logic that's built into the very basic technique. So, um, so his fundamental kind of partner drill is called offensive defensor. Uh, so my, my opponent will come in, so their number one attack, and the first level would just be blocking. So, and at this point, um, the Grandmaster doesn't place a big emphasis on, on how your body moves exactly, just really um, getting a kind of feel for it. Uh, and the same then happens with um, the second level, which is where uh, we counter. So, so we have a single counter. And the, the kind of cool thing about this type of training is that um, initially it starts in that formal pattern, but eventually it can break from that pattern. So, for example, um, I can I can throw uh, if you if you notice that my defence here is like a number one and my uh, second, uh, counter is like a number two, right? In terms of the Benassi system, that would be the one and two, right? So this is the uh, one. And this is the two, but I could equally as well um, do this. I could strike at, at my opponent, and then as she goes to counter strike at me, um, I could use my two as a kind of deflection. Um, it could be that, um, for example, so uh, I'm in mid motion here um, and strike again, and now I get my two, right? So, um, so just even that very basic kind of one and two can switch between being, um, the block can become an attack and the attack can, can become a block, right? 
So then we get to the, um, the third stage, which is multiple counters. And so, um, so in multiple counters, we have one, two, and then three. And this is where we get into a really interesting, inter excuse me, an interesting aspect of Bernard's Estigatas, which is um, unlike De Campo, which has this kind of uh, pulse kind of action to it, um, Estigatas has um, a kind of uh, forward, like multi-directional movement, including a kind of up and down aspect to it, right? So, um, so we can hive, hive, low. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so high, high, low. And uh, you hear this kind of tumbada thing, right, hitting the ground, which is kind of uh, also a way of fi finishing the movement. It can be bouncing off the ground, but it's also teaching you to cut, to, like strike right through. We don't do it with blades, um, but it's, it's uh, definitely a thing with a stick. So um, then the fourth level, Beck's going to insert a counter movement while I'm trying to do my multiple counters. So, so I have my one, two, and now she goes for me. And this is the thing I was saying before about learning from teaching, that if you look at it like this, I block her here, and I've got a, a clean shot on her for my first counter strike. I've in fact got a clean shot on her for my second counter strike. But as my second counter strike is completing, this is my most vulnerable moment, and that's when she throws her counter, and I have to um, return the other way. So, so we end up with. And so, uh, one of the things that's going on in Bernard's sister cards is we have initially, um, or the base of the principle uh, system is called um, our contra cargada, which means uh, literally uh, to meet the cargo. <laughs> Um, so you should think about it as like meeting the load or meeting the force, right? So it's a way of saying meeting the force. But um, another way of understanding that is attack the attack. So when it comes, I attack the attack and then counter. And then only at this fourth level do, I, do we introduce the idea of going with the force. Um, but in going with the force, you notice something particular happens where as I go with the force, I'm still attacking the attack or attacking the, I can uh, go against the person, but I, I'm going against the direction of the strike as I parry. So there's, so there's a definite principle in um, Estacadas of where you can, you, um, you go against the attack. Um, and I've always found this kind of very useful as a principle because, um, if, let me move back just a little, if she moves as fast as she can, um, I don't have to move very fast. To block it, I just, have to, I just have to get my angle right, right? Um, but if um, if I try to follow her, I have to move even faster to catch up. So actually, our contra cargada is a kind of nice principle, and a lot of systems um, I know use that as their base in some form or another. They have a kind of idea of that. Uh, it, what I find interesting in, in estacadas is, but not estacadas, is that um, it's only kind of in this. Um, action where you learn then to do it through parrying with your hand um, to take the force in the opposite direction. Um, so that's a, one of the kind of cool drills. There's disarms in Estacadas as well. Um, the disarms all work um, actually as if um, you're handling a blade um, and not just uh, and not just handling um, uh, sticks. So there's not kind of an intellectual shift with, um, with that. As I mentioned before, um, the uh, the idea is that uh, there should be corners um, when you're striking with a weapon. So the other thing you'll see is this kind of turning action in the wrist with um, the number one strike. So instead of doing it like like a blade where it's cut something like that, um, what you get in estacadas is this action where you get this tip um, for the for the first strike. So um, so you get a kind of uh, power through the um, turning of the wrist as well. Um, and again, that's different. So um, so if Beck uh, grabs her sword, uh, got it. Oh, the one you... Oh, the um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, Beck's going to demonstrate, um, like, I'll demonstrate with corners, and then she, uh, <laughs> and, well, she's going to demonstrate without corners. So. Anyway, <laughs>
So, um, so that was like without corners, right? So that that kind of smoothness to it. Um, whereas if we go with the, um, the the with corners, right? You see. So there's a kind of um, more stopping kind of action. Then if you compare that to the cambo, um, this is where I think it's kind of interesting because you see you see this kind of um, like uh, let's say like a wand-like action. So the last thing I want to point out in the demo was um, something about the footwork. So uh, when you go to pass pass, which is is a little bit tiring sometimes. <laughs> In fact, um, people, yeah. must, people must know what the purpose of pass pass is. I've heard different explanations. But one time, uh, Paolo, you know, I think a, a grading asked um, Master Jomlin and uh, <coughs> to explain what he believed pass pass was for. And he kind of, um, partly humorously but uh, truthfully, said that actually his um, uh, his father used to get, or his grandfather used to get people to do it when they were training for Weird or Toro. So you would have to go through the entire curriculum while, while doing pass pass. So, so you've got that kind of constant movement. Well, if you think about being in a little village in the Philippines and not having skipping ropes or training on rocks and you know where twigs are and everything, you probably couldn't really do skipping, right? But actually, it makes sense that this would build up stamina. You can hear what it's doing in my chest right now. So, um, so there is a kind of logic to that, but we also know um, that it works. Oh, in my experience, it works. It can work, and you see this with I think they're um, I'm kind of using it like almost like the balestra in fencing, where whereas you attack, you get a half step and a full step. So, so you, you kind of can use it to um, trick your opponent's range. So again, you could use it in a motion where um, the person thinks you're coming in, but you've only half stepped. They've committed to wherever they are, and then you full step um, into the action. But uh, the other interesting thing about it is, when we first trained with Paul, it was very obvious. Um, he mentioned something like crab-like movement, and it was very obvious that the campo lets you kind of move um, in a circle around your opponent, right? So that if Beck um, is sort of my, my opponent there, um, that as I as I start the pass pass, I can I can move around her because of the square stance and because of um, you know, because of the square micro stance, adjustments. yeah, and the micro adjustments, I can keep my centre line facing her all the time through the micro adjustments provided by the pass pass. Um, in comparison, as I say, Estegardus doesn't have it, um, and uh, I know very must have been us. It's not particularly a big fan because uh, because of the amount of energy it, it can um, eat up, which it does. And you wouldn't, I don't think you would fight like that continuously. But you would. Um, there's certainly that moment of uh, explosion in the exchange. And I mean, Jose Cabrera would make the point that if a fight goes on longer than three seconds, um, then it's taking too long. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, the one, two, three is always really important. Um, one last thing I promised was. Um, that we demonstrate, um, I won't give away the secrets unless Paolo puts in the chat that we're allowed to. But, um, <laughs> um, but um, one thing about Tecampo with this, with this kind of um, wrist, wrist turning, you can get multiple strikes off the one uh, in the one pass, right? So, um, so instead of like a single hit, I don't know if you can hear this okay, you may, may or may not be able to, depending on if it changes the sound. Um, but we can also get multiple hits on the one path. So, so, um, so, De Campo literally in terms of the one, two, three, it's been expressed as like uh, as fast to learn as one, two, three. Don't let a fight go on longer than three seconds. Um, it kind of has three key levels, like pri um, primary, elementary, high school, college. Um, it also. Um, uh, it said that the grandmaster used to wait for three seconds, and if you hadn't moved, he would he would attack. Um, it, there's a kind of we we definitely attack in more uh, like some patterns are three, but some are more. Um, but 
um, yeah, we, it, there's a sort of idea of the first strike, um, like initi initiate, counter, um, finish, if you like. So, um, so I might initiate a strike, counter, and then finish. Um, so there's some um, kind of many reasons why it's called one, two, three. Um, the other thing I did, I did uh, sort of signal this, and this is probably a better um, vision to show this. But uh, I, in terms of that sparring idea before about using different languages, and in terms of um, my own experience with these systems, is that they do um, allow you to express yourself differently in the movement. And so again, um, the technique called the Campbell Original is this one. Right? So that's a decamper way of doing it. If I do it faster, so it's that kind of movement. Um, if I do the same thing in Estacadas, keep it for close range, it, the whole body dynamic changes. It's the same movement, but you get a different kind of action. So this kind of, oh. um, so you could say um, these strikes are common to the systems, but um, their way of expressing is completely different. And I've got to say, that's the thing I got most from training with Paul and Grandmaster Vanas. Um, really having that experience that the differences in the systems are actually important and make a difference. I think we'll stop the demo there, uh, unless people have got questions about it. Bravo. Awesome. 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 Yeah, I heard the same thing. I heard the one, two, three was if you didn't go, he was going. You know, you know, he would count out one, two, three, and the opponent didn't do anything. He was he was initiating. You know. Yeah. You, know? <laughs> you know, but uh oh, that was that was excellent. I, I thank you. That was really good that as far as a compare and contrast, you know. And um so what um jeez. Uh, from there, how did you get involved with the book? How did that come about? Well, um, I mean, everyone has their talents, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, um, right? So. Uh, and uh, you know, I've, I wanted to be a writer when I left school. And um, I ended up going to uni and then dropping out, went on a pilgrimage to India. I always say I went there a mystic and came back a skeptic. Um, <laughs> but then um, I eventually became a teacher, not a... Not a um, uh, like a writer or a journalist or whatever. But um, but then that kind of led me to academia where I do lots of writing. So it sort of struck me that, um, you know, I think everyone uh, deep down loves the idea of having a book, right? And uh, and I wanted to give something back to um, to Paolo and to um, Grandmaster Benas. Um, and, you know, obviously my talents were in that area. And so I suggested how about we collaborate on a book, right? Um, and, um, and so... Uh, Paul had already done a lot of work with Grandmaster Benas in translating his system into an online kind of course, right? Um, which is not easy, right? Like, in, and particularly when you think about that kind of mm -hmm. world aspect, like how do you do that and whatever. Um, and Paul's definitely um, was very important in, in helping Grandmaster Benas um, achieve that. Uh, it struck me that all those videos were sitting there um, and that from those videos we could actually capture um, the movement and, um, and actually turn it into a book. So um, so that's something then that I worked on from the material. Um, we then, uh, I would send things forward and back with um, Paolo and Grandmaster Vanas and they would, uh, you know, correct things or suggest things or whatever, um, or, you know, uh, makes it... Give extra terminology as well sometimes. Yeah, so, so um, that was really useful to kind of um, uh, pick their brain around also things that seem like um, they mean something in an everyday sense for us, but um, that actually may be an idiom, right? They may, so our contra cagada is a good example. It sounds like it's straight, if you translate it directly, it literally means meeting the load or meeting the cargo, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, but it doesn't, that's not, it's, that's not its idiomatic meaning, right? Which is actually to attack the attack or to meet the force. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the other ones was uh, cat stance versus sitting stance. Because um, when it was translated first to us, we talked about sitting, like, in in the motion. But then, um, I mean, of course, the connections made with lots of, like, other martial arts that have that kind of cat stance there. And when we, when you guys were talking about it, it came out that the direct translation means to sit. And it actually makes more sense when you're going more fluid. That it's like, kind of like you're on a chair rather than 
being a cat. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes, and I'm a big believer in that. Um, mm -hmm. Like, uh, for example, the technique in Decambo called Hug and Hubbard. Um, uh, I was talking to Grandmaster Benas about language one time, and I said, oh, so what does that mean to you, right? And he said, oh, uh, Hug it means to bait or invite. And who, mm -hmm. uh, who but obviously means to undress, right? Or um, in this case, to take away or something like that, right? So, um, so hugged who but is a method of um, uh, basically uh, kind of baiting your opponent to hit your hand and then you counter him, right? Um, that's one of the kind of meanings of it. Um, but it, but it can also mean, um, or at least that's that's one interpretation of of what the words mean, right? Which is kind of useful, I think. Um, but yeah, another yeah. example that I learned from these guys was, you know, if we say Hubad Lubad, Lubad, right, I've always noticed that um, different countries spell these things differently because we spell it the way we hear it, right? And I don't know why, but very few people go and look at a dictionary. So um, so I yeah. made a point when I wrote the book um, with the guys is every term they gave me, I would go to, the book, uh, to a dictionary and make sure that my spelling was consistent with whatever the... Um, kind of standard spelling of that term is in the dictionary, mm. um, not necessarily what that person might have given me. So, for example, um, one one exception is the word uh, "wedo," right? So, Grandmaster Vanus spells "wedo" W E D O. Um, it comes from a Spanish word "wedo" O I D O, and and means to hear. And um, and so, if you think about um, someone who can play a guitar but has never learned. Right, so they just hear a song and then they they do it on their guitar and they can play by hearing. That's weird, and um, okay. and so uh, it's only used in two ways in the Philippines: people who can play guitar without ever learning formally, or martial artists. Oh so, uh, so a martial artist who's never been formally trained but can fight, um, or who you know has the system like has a way of moving and whatever. That's that's weird, and um, so um. So again, like you can see with Tatang, right, Ilustrissimo, that same kind of vibe, right, where he's kind of learned through School of Hard Knocks. You're, or being, you're feeding him and you're learning by getting hit. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah so, that's, so that's how the book started. And, then, um, and actually one of the things that I was really keen about was for us to try to capture um, there's, there's ways of moving in the system that mm -hmm. uh, are so, sort of not linear, right, and I wanted to really capture that in the book. So when you look at some of the illustrations, you'll see if, if it kind of moves in a circle, that the images are related, put in that way. If it, if it moves in sort of the, the diagonal, the images are placed in that way, rather than just a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, four, yeah. Five, and just folks, here's the book, folks, if you're interested in getting it. Um, Guru Robert was kind enough to give this to me, uh, but here it is. So a compilation between the three, but... Um, I'm waiting to dive into it. Um, as I mentioned to both uh, Guru Rebecca and Guru Robert, I've been just swamped with it. It's been wonderful, free books. I just haven't got the time uh, to go through them. This unfortunately be one of them. But again, folks, this is the book here. And also, Guru Robert was kind enough to give some for um, for our upcoming raffle too, which was very yeah. nice of him. We're, we're also going to do, Paolo and I are, talked about doing something on um, DeCampo, and we certainly have other um, ones to do on Estacadas as time goes on as well. Um, I'm trying to encourage Paolo also to do one on sort of kind of related to his FMA teaching because he's got, um, you know, I think a very analytical mind that actually, um, you know, comes up with kind of interesting drills and whatever, and I think mm. we should commit some of that to, to the page as well. How long did it how long did it take the collaboration between the three of you um i reckon so the good news for me is because i'm an academic um <laughs> i can i can frame this and in case any of my academic colleagues are watching this is the truth um uh i realized um that what we're really talking about here is uh actually i was inspired by Paolo's kind of commitment to preserving some of the um classical systems right and he kind of worked mm -hmm. with um uh, Grandmaster Siniza, um to capture um, Baral Subbo. Um, he was he, he you know worked with Grandmaster Vanas and obviously with um, Master Jomelin to kind of capture the campo. So I, I was sort of inspired by that, and I could see that there's an academic project about preserving the intangible cultural heritage mm -hmm. of the Philippines, and that the FMA is an intangible cultural heritage. You know, like if we don't if we don't record it, it'll be lost. And um, mm -hmm. and so Paolo was doing that via video. I could see books as another way to do that. 
Um, and so, again, because of my academic connections, I'm an editor of the journal and, you know, I have that kind of background so I could kind of uh, bring to bear that. So I could use my academic time to do this academic project, which also happens to be a great project for, you know, FMA regardless. So, um, so actually, it probably took, um, I don't know, maybe uh, uh, three months yeah. or something like that. And I'd say the last month I was spent... Wow. Yeah. Okay. I oh. thought much longer. Okay. Well, see, the, well, the cool thing is that the, the guys had already filmed everything except the Opens City Pensa. They'd filmed in a jungle setting. <laughs> so um, you couldn't see anything. When I tried to capture stuff in the video, you couldn't see it. Um, so um, so Paul and Grandmaster Benas went back to a really good location um, in Murunduku where they're living um, and uh, refilmed the Opens City Pensa stuff. Um, and from that, I could extract the much clearer images, right? Um, so, but then I was doing probably 16 hour days on it, like just because it was a passion project in the last kind of maybe three or four weeks, I was like desperate to, I want, I, I really wanted for the Grandmaster to get it out by Christmas. There was sort of a Christmas present to him um, to, for us to be finished, right? Um, yeah. And I did promise him we'd get volume two out by his birthday, but we, we won't, it's not, we don't have time. Um, his birthday's 30th of June, um, yeah. but, um, also, we've talked about probably um, we, we, we will try to meet up in the Philippines um, with him and Paolo again, and um, and it's certainly important for the Estacadas book, the next volume of the Estacadas book, because uh, what because what we haven't felt right, like because um, we've been training. I think um, actually Elric was asking a question about this, but because we've been training online with Grandmaster and us, um, it's not like we, we haven't felt his pressure, you know. Like so, when you get to something like Estacado, okay. Um, I've got ideas about that from all my previous training, but, mm. but we haven't felt his pressure, you know, like, and what does he do and how does he, you know, or even with disarms and whatever, how, you know, what are the subtle little things that are going on that you, he, he may not verbalise or can't be seen, right? And, um, you know, so, and Louis, Louis asked me if I'm going to Europe, there is a plan potentially in October, but things, uh, my university doesn't want people travelling at my new insurance, so maybe, but, um, but, um, we, we're going to try to get to see uh, the guys in the Philippines again in the not too distant future, and the next book will forward to Canada. Uh, oh, like, yeah, I mean, uh, you guys are not that far from each other, right? A two hour, it's a two hour time difference, so it's it's an eight hour flight. It's eight hour flight, yeah. but if we were living, okay. yeah, but that's because we're like far down on Australia's massive, actually, right? Um, it's a three hour, like four or five hour flight to get to Cairns from where we are. And that's sort of the and top. That's the top. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. All right, I wouldn't have but, thought. Okay. But if we were living in, if we were living in the northern northern Australia, like in Darwin, it's we're probably like it's basically, uh, you know, I don't know, like an hour and a half to Indonesia, and then another hour and a half to yeah. the Philippines, right? So we're yeah. pretty, we are pretty close. Yeah. yeah. No. Wow. So um, this is an interesting question from Dan. I thought so. You, you teach at the um, university in body archaeology so any like connection to your martial arts training yeah um i mean i think th there's some funny connections actually the, fir the first i would say is so i grew up in a single parent family um with my mum um and my grandparents um and i think i one of the reasons i started martial arts when i was 14 mum had a, a partner at the time who was um a austrian guy who um actually was into in interested in tai chi and and uh, Chinese martial arts, and that kind of that kind of you know perked my interest. And I kind of mm -hmm. think martial arts was a bit of a like a, a rite of passage, you know, like it was a thing I kind of did to become a man or something like that. I know that sounds really mm -hmm. wanky or something, but but that I think that's what get sort of <laughs> get, yeah, get the muscle. <laughs> so so um, I think that's what how it started. Um, and but also because I didn't know about my father's side of the family, that also triggered a kind of interest in history. Right, so I wanted to know about that right as well, and so I think martial arts and history have always sort of travelled together for me. And it was also um, I, it was also very obvious to me when you look at something like Wing Chun, um, it's designed to go against um, like sort of northern long fist styles of kung fu, right? So, okay. so that you know you can break in and track those kind of long strikes um, and be more direct. It's completely logical in that context um, when you try it against a boxer. And my very first um, sparring mm, session. I can, I can tell you about my experience with that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I got dropped on my ass three times in my very first time sparring. I, I, I can't I, even I, listen. I almost got it. 
yeah, yeah. So exactly. So so um, uh, so I've always been sort of mindful that martial arts always have a context, and um, and the more you understand of the context, the more you can understand why they might be doing something a certain way. Um, I'm a I'm also a big believer in, uh, and and I think from our earlier chat, you probably are too, Dean. That like I I want to dedicate myself to the thing. I don't want to just go in and go, um, you know, the sort of if you take too literally absorb what's useful and reject what's useful and all that, you can literally start judging things before you've even tried them. Um, mm. And whereas, what I, you know, if DiCampo said you've got to flick out that wrist in that um, Abierta stri uh, strike to Abierta, right? Um, then rather than go, oh, why are we doing that? Um, I just keep practicing it until I kind of, you know, or why is the kick pick there? You know, we'll practice it and find out because when you practice it, you start to realize things about what it's doing. You know, if you monitor your body, you start to mm. kind of feel, ah, this is what's actually happening. Um, so then to, this is a segue to Dan's question. Okay. So um, so actually, um, I kind of then started working on a methodology that I was calling kinesthetic archaeology, right? Um, and what I meant by that was um, we've got we've got this system of Jose Caballero. It was written down. We can see it's written down. It's been passed down. We can see the variants um, that happen, like so um, the living one of the living students um, of, if not, I mean, maybe still the only one, I'm, I'm not sure, um, uh, in Eric Olivares, um, we can see what he's doing. We mm. can see what um, Master Jomelin's doing, and we have video of his father, who was also a direct student, and what he's doing, right? Um, we can see what Edgar Sulate was doing from videos. Um, you know, one thing that's noticeable to a DeCampo practitioner is when you watch um, Edgar Sulate, you can see the affectation of um, KI. Right, so he doesn't he doesn't strike so wide as you would see Master John. Oh, small circle of the eyes. You know, so and again, if you look at Eric Olivares, who also taught um, at Basilite as well, um, mm. he he also kind of moves small circle. And Paolo makes a big point that De Campo starts big circle and moves small circle. So so you start you really emphasise the big circle to get that kind of pulse going um, and understand how your body works, and then over time. Um, as I hope it, you could see with the when I did the serrata fast, um, you can actually like you small circle it right, and it, okay. and suddenly it's much tighter. Um, so so anyway, kinesthetic archaeology then is a way of kind of practicing a technique with a view to mastery, and mm. getting into the technique and go, and trying to uh, sort of backward map to well what does that person like what were they trying to do with this movement right what does this movement actually do so if you like it's like layers of archaeology that you're digging through right and i was talking to elric jundas about it um he became a kind of very uh useful critical friend in this and i gave him an early draft of the paper i'd written and he said um why do you call it kinesthetic uh, anthropology because because really it's broader than just the technique right it's the culture as well and all that and so mm. in the end, I said on kinesthetic anthropology. Thanks, Eric. Um, and uh, and that paper's going to be pub like it's been accepted for publication, but won't come out till sometime next year. Oh, fantastic! Uh, but, okay. Yeah, but it's been accepted, um, and it really explores this kind of idea of both both the, the history, um, the uh, this kind of archaeology archaeology of technique inside a kind of um, bigger understanding of the culture and. Uh, and maybe what you can, but what at least my experience of what I think the is trying to do. And as I say, every every person will have different experiences. There was definitely things Beck felt that were different to me coming mm. back. And you know. no, no, well, wow, that was inter that was interesting. Um, here's a question for you, Guru Rebecca. You know, some difficulties and issues with online training. Yeah, I mean, the obvious ones are you're two D in a three D world, <laughs> so when they're trying to pick you up on things, it's very hard to know. Like, we've had multiple instances of, um, so you need to hit straight at your center and I'll be over here. And it's like, I am hitting at my center, but my hand's over my shoulder. And it's like, well, if I was in the middle, <laughs> it right. is there. So, I mean, there's like, when you're doing fine tuning stuff, that's quite difficult. Um, yeah, and again, the pressure, you don't know, like how hard are they hitting, how much, like, do you have to hit to block that? Um, because mm. if we're feeding each other, we're going to be responsive to each other. But, like, it's hard to know then what's the original technique, if you like. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, in saying that, like, there's all sorts of ways to come around that. Like, we've done lots of things where, um, you know, putting lines on the floor <laughs> so that you yeah, can get creative. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you get creative, yeah. Um, 
And I think we, we were all very visual learners, but also having more than one of us on. Um, so we also have Chris who trains with us as well, and he's um, a very technical thinker as well. Mm. Um, like more so than myself, I'm more like kind of, I get the big movement and then I'll fine tune it. He wants the fine tune and then he'll get it big. Um, so having like the three of us thinking very differently um, with our teachers on online also helps that a lot because we can kind of go, well, I thought he meant this. And they'll be like, no, no, it was definitely this. Yeah, yeah, off. Yeah. yeah, so then you end up with this kind of happy medium. And then we can come back to Paolo or to Grandmaster Bernas and be like, so was this what you meant? And they'll go either yay or nay and we'll go again from there. Yeah. So it's it's a lot of lot more communication I think goes on mm. if you're in the class. If you're in the class, it's very like physical communication, but a lot less verbal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So future, I mean, uh, future goals for each one of you. So what's uh, who are us? So we, yeah, any uh, what are your future yeah. goals and things? Well, obviously, obviously, there's the academic projects to keep kind of yeah. um, producing yeah. The, yeah. the archives. Um, but also personally, um, like I'm 56, mm -hmm. I realise you know like. Uh, the clock ticks right a little bit in terms of um, physical capacity and whatever. Certainly, I think um, Capoeira will um, <laughs> probably die before for um, FMA. Um, but um, uh, I think that I, I certainly want to master the system, like these two systems. Um, mm -hmm. I, 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 as I said, we said before, we've definitely got an interest in um, things like, particularly the Visayan um, Puerto Cadena Screamo system. Um, because we can see, as I say, a kind of overlap with our capoeira and um, and the uh, pedagogy of games is yeah. really interesting. I think that's play. fair. That's, yeah. Like there was one system in FMA. I would yeah. I would pick that system. Yeah. Yeah. So so our, the weird thing for us is that um, uh, VSCK has has the um, the kind of um, logic of training of capoeira, um, mm. but. But Vanessa is actually surprisingly to us um, had the movement, mm -hmm. and Grandmaster Vanessa has sort of expressed to us that um, uh, you know we, we've picked up the um, the kind of footwork and whatever um, better than you know other students he's had, um, and that that really it's coming out of our capoeira, um, and because we're very attentive to footwork, um, and so and and also the body the swaying body action that happens in mm -hmm. this present as well um, and it made it gave us clues to how to use that and and how it actually works and how the dodging works and all that kind of stuff um, yeah so I certainly want to master um, estacadas uh, but not estacadas um, I you know I've got I've committed myself uh, to like with the grandmaster to kind of um, help preserve his system um, I, I certainly you know likewise in DeCampo um, I think um, DeCampo is obviously now being practiced by a lot more people which is also Kind of helpful for that system um and for its survival which is great um estacada is a skill we're really the, as far as i know we're really the only serious international i mean i think he's taught bits to other people um but mm -hmm. we're kind of the serious international crew um and i think that um one thing i would really strongly suggest to people is don't don't um kind of judge the systems by the basics in the mm -hmm. sense that if you look at a system like estacada's um, you could feel like, oh, yeah, that's pretty similar to what I was already doing, right? Um, but it, that's not where it ends up. Like, you have to mm -hmm. kind of master that basic stuff to get to the kind of really the weird old kind of elements of it. And um, mm -hmm. when you get there, it's it's a jewel, right? Um, and I think, again, with DeCampo, people could look and go, oh, you know, what's that pick pick business? Those guys are just beatboxing their body or something. Mm -hmm. right? um, but actually, if Maybe when you rhythms. when you study it, right, like you get so much more out of it. And this, you're always yeah. you're always finding new things, right? And um, think about the principles yeah. that underline the art rather than what you're just seeing. Like mm. how do you get to that? Why are they using that and not these other fifty techniques that you already know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's probably for me. Like those are the things that like um, I'm working towards. What about you? And we feel like our school to expand, you know? Like yeah, it's always nice yeah. to have more people to meet up. Right? You, need, yeah. you need new bodies so that we're not going up against the same people all the time. But yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. For sure, for sure. What about, um, how about you? Same question, Guru Rebecca. What are, you, what are your future goals in, in I mean, far as FMA? Yeah, I'm currently um, on my path to becoming instructor in Esther Carter's. So that hasn't happened okay. yet. I'll be migrating probably around Grandmaster Bernas's birthday. 
Um, we were talking about it the other night. So that's kind of the, the short term goal, I guess. But yeah, long term is definitely like finding mastery in it. Um, just like, yeah, I love teaching. So teaching more of FMA. Yeah, ah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I do one night out of the fortnight with these guys. And um, it's funny, like I was saying, I've been teaching Capoeira now for about four or five years. And so I can walk into a class, look at the students, go, great, we're doing this tonight. I don't have to lesson the plan. But I still have to think in FMA, what are we doing? <laughs> what am I going to teach? Yeah, so it would be nice to get to a point where I don't have to think. <laughs> I can just sure, for sure. Think. In, in yeah. our school, we have like Chris. Chris out. Okay, kind of. You somewhat answered this, I think, when you were talking about sparring and what you incorporated. But uh, what are the distinct tactics and methods from Estocadas that you have found to be effective in sparring? So this is so, this is a little more specific. But. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I did touch on it, but I can address that more directly. Um, and Beck might have other kind of approaches, but um, but I would say. Um, one of the key things for me is that switch between attack and defense so that as something which um, starts as offensa as, a, as an offensive movement um, mm. could in fact be turned into a defensive movement um, if uh, you know in the flow so basically so if I'm like say just doing X's um, yeah. and then suddenly the person throws something I could turn that into um, was slick which is our uh, kind of rearward striking defense and then counter um, and I'd still be just doing X's um, So that was one logic. I really like his paired logic. Actually, I didn't mention it mention it But he has this concept called tug dua and tug tuck and these concepts um, Initially start as okay. You're going to do strike tug dua is two strikes So you do one and two then you do two and three then three and four like that kind of logic right up to 12 um, but that's not where it stops, right? Because then you can do what we call a Lacotte version of that, which is that you pair Abierta strikes with Serrata strikes. So then it becomes one and two still, but then it's one and one and four, and then it's one and six. Uh, yeah, mm. and one, one, you know, so so you get this kind of other pairing. And what he's really teaching you is um, the switch, like like that. When you get to Lacotte, you realise that you've got this kind of um, constant switching from side to side going on again, like Capoeira, right? It's a lot of economy of motion. Yeah, you know, economy of motion, yeah. Rather than uh, like having to retract and hit again on the same side, there's a lot of like just commit through and then go again in the other. And, and then you tug tuck yeah, yeah. yeah. And then tug tuck loose the same. So it can be done in the form of pass and nod, like so following, yeah. so one, two, three, two, three, four. Um, or it can be done in the form of lacotte. And so you start to kind of go, you know, one, two, one, um, for example. And so uh, to, to Franz's question, I found that like super useful because I can I can kind of watch like my opponent and go all right um, I'm going to combine like you know he's, he seems to be vulnerable to a downward attack um, mm -hmm. like he brings his guard up you know uh, or actually not vulnerable he brings his guard up like he's helpful so um so then I might go like seven and then eight like trust so strike down trust um, okay. and so that and that's straight from the basics that's straight from Tugdua um, so I found that like uh, really useful yeah okay. no. Uh, I like the kind of parry and counter type kind of tactic. So uh, they call it palapa when you pass and then hit, or um, I mean like payong and hit. Especially because I'm a, a bit smaller, I often tend to try and counter attack rather than blitz okay. an opponent. So I'll wait until they attack, find the timing, and then come in. Um, so those are the kind of tactics that I tend to use. Um, I mean they're still in the camp as well, I guess. I'm, I'm not sure that's specific to Estacadas. Um, definitely the multiple, but like same strike. So that was just saying seven and eight, like repeating that over um, yeah, yeah. quite well. Uh, so it is like oitzel oitzel going up three and four, the figure eights. Yeah, um, yeah. And as, as you see, because we have like in that elemental framework, I'd be a fire type, right? And Beck's more wind, or you know, yeah. yeah. And now our friend Chris is sort of more water. Um, so uh, so he likes to fight. He likes to counter fight. Beck likes to counter fight, but kind of be more um, mobile. And um, and I tend to keep pressure on my opponent, right? So we all have, and that kind of shapes the way you then draw from the system, because of course. Yeah. They, you know, personality driven kind yeah, of type. body type and what res yeah, and what resonates yeah. to your physical attributes. Yeah, yeah. for sure, yeah, for exactly. sure. But uh wow, this has been uh, this has been wonderful. We 
So uh, I don't know if you guys really know. I kind of went by fast, two hours. It did. Yeah, yeah really. I just saw that. But yeah, I thought your guys' demos were, I, I thought they were well articulated, well performed, and you know, thank you both. I mean, that was especially uh, on the information too. That that whole college study you were explaining about, I mean, that, that's that's fascinating. Mm. You know, that that kin kinetic flow, the study you're doing. Um, yeah. Um, I can't. I'm looking forward to. It. You know, with, your, with your paper on that it yeah sounds, cool yeah yeah no for sure I, that's that's fascinating you know but uh yeah so what i do is i down um download this and i'll, I'll definitely you know put it on your guys wall and all that but i i, I think there's gonna be well watched yeah this this was uh this was enjoyable you know and again first Thank father you. and daughter episode so <laughs> there that that right there that counts right should we, uh, should we show up that potty trick Oh yeah, we, should we? Yeah, this is this What's is the, this is the who better lose less potting here. This oh, okay. is like the second That's what she used to do when she was like this Little, big. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. That, that's awesome. <laughs> but uh. Well, I, th I appreciate both of you. Thank you so much. You know. Thanks, Dean. Well, thanks for having us on. Yeah. We really oh, yeah. It. yeah, happy to do. Happy to do. So, uh, but yeah, I'm gonna be looking out for your stuff coming out, and um, yeah, and uh, feel free, eat, eat, both of you, I and mean, post in the group. You know what I mean? Let people see what you guys are doing. You know what I mean? I would take advantage of it. You know? <laughs> that works. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know. All right, well, you guys take care. <laughs> All right, thank you. Saludo. Absolutely. <laughs> wow, great episode. So many regards. Uh, <clears throat> those demos. Oh. So who is next? Um, that is a fantastic question. I believe who is next is going to be early next week. And I think it's going to be on the Martial Arts Symposium that was held in New Hampshire. Tim Hartman and the guy who runs it, uh, Terry Dow, just incredible guy, just what he does up there. And they formed just a whole thing just on FMA. So I really want Terry just to be, you know, kind of recognized and things. So I think we'll be pulling those two on. And I think that's going to be Tuesday. And uh, yeah. And plus, we got Mother's Day coming up Sunday. So it's going to be tough to squeeze usually i'd like to do one on sunday but ain't gonna be this sunday so yeah so look out for that on tuesday um i don't think tom's got anything going on, on saturday or not that i'm aware of so but yeah folks thanks you those who watched if you haven't already please subscribe to FMA discussion where the more views and subscription or subscribers i should say we get the more revenue we get to give to charity all right folks all right thank you for watching and we'll see you next time Thank you.